said, and call to order. Yep. It's coming. Everybody ready? I don't have my gavel. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I have a good fit. I think that's, that's about all I can work with tonight. Okay, that's okay. That's as far as I got. <laughs> so, with that being said, we'll start over there and introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm the new kid on the block. I'm Dan Stearns, from the Town Budget Committee. Mike Stevens. Okay. Mel Brooks, Budget Committee. Okay. Tom Mangles, Business Administrator. Steve Iowa, Superintendent. Ann Wiggett, Board Chair. Millie Nelson, board. Kim Woodson, vice chair. Patty Drapo, uh, board <laughs> clerk. <laughs> Steve, Gelly. Long day. Yeah. Yeah. Steve Gelly, budget committee. Diane Cummings, budget committee. And we'll start with you. <laughs> Jennifer Carbonell, principal of high school. Greg Kelly, assistant principal. Kelly Nolan, director of student services. Russell Martin, principal of Lake Hill. Justin Rushak, Wilton Curry. Kyle uh, Smith, great technical director. Uh, Dale Fryer, Director of Operations. Eric Daffbeard, uh, Lakeway Assistant Principal. Okay. So, and down to number three. So, overview, Dr. Niles. Okay. Uh, we yes. met with uh, several members of the Budget Committee yesterday, gave them the, the, the budget that we, uh, the preliminary budget that we've been working on now for a while, uh, literally since the beginning of the summer. And there's a reason why they call them preliminary and draft and those kinds of things. Things do change from time to time. But I thought it was important as we started out that we know what the document that you have represents, what it, what it is, what it isn't, where things stand. So the document you have shows an increase of a little over $200,000, 1.33%. That's on the general fund. It, it's status quo with, with staffing uh, and positions. Uh, but there are a couple of additions in, that are built into this budget, an addition of a school social worker at Lakeway Elementary with some funding come out of, coming out of an IDEA, IDEA grant, and in a, an adjustment in the teacher education program, and again, due to, frankly, student demand and program needs uh, from 0.5 to 1.0. And, and I know there'll be discussion later about those, uh, and certainly questions about those. This budget was built on, a, on, a, on a, what, we were, what we were hearing is a worst case scenario estimates on health insurance. Well, you never know. I was with a group of superintendents today and I heard 20% increase from one of them. I heard all kinds of numbers and so I was very happy when I opened my, when I opened my email asking Tom about our rate increase and found out that our rates actually are going down 3.4%. So, you know, that 100,000 or 110 or whatever is in there will happen, from health insurance at least. Um, so, you know, and I think that I think that's that's important. I think I think that obviously it's, it's good news it's going down. I think that uh, I think that it's it's one piece of evidence that uh, the, our consumer driven uh, plans that now all of our employees are on is working. Uh, the 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 old high cost, low deductible, they, lo they love it. Everyone loves a low deductible, pay everything five bucks and you get to do whatever you want. You know, those days are gone. We're not funding those anymore. We're not asking the taxpayers to pay for those anymore, by the way. Uh, the, the new policies that we have do have some significant deductibles. Uh, they, they do encourage uh, consumerism. And that's one thing that in both, both of the major school and public employer carriers in the state are really pushing is consumer driven health insurance. You know, put some put some of put some of the cost on the on the consumer. So the days when the days when we go in and have no idea what something's going to cost, uh, hope they're coming to an end because it's it's led to some massive increases in health insurance. So these are, so these plans, I'm 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 pleased. I mean, they they some evidence that uh, as I, as I said, school care is not dropping our rates because they like Tom and I and the board and everybody else. They're dropping our rates because we're costing them less money. And we're costing them less money because we're not using them as much. Um, so the, the point down below now is kind of you know the actual rate now is known. Uh, we, we're 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 in in negotiations with uh, with our our carrier our contracted bus service. Um, we our increase our rates have increased a percent and a half a year under our old contract. Uh, we'd hope to keep it at that. Uh, we don't know. We, we do. We did try to build this budget 
based on our best numbers and uh, so we did put a little bit of an increase in there for transportation and then the, then the, the money that goes to those are not covered in uh, either the teachers uh, contract or the uh, the uh, the uh, support staff contract uh, and that includes the people listed their custodians administrative assistants and the SAU office the admin assistants and the buildings are covered by the support staff uh, contract and the administrators uh, is that group of people that fall into the into that 1.5 percent increase um, and then I, I said below just a couple of things and and I know you all know this uh, already you know the budgets you know the history you know what's happened but I and again this is it just we just as we as we put this together we, we have reduced the budget or the I will say the budget has gotten lower by 600,000 uh, we tried we tried to do it all in one year a couple of years ago and, and the town said no that's too much and then last year we thought well maybe we got it about right and the town said no you need to get that other 300 in there which happened so the bottom line is with the, the budget has reduced uh, six hundred thousand dollars in the last couple of years and then the, the preliminary budget that uh, that you have before you um, is about hundred fifty thousand dollars hundred fifty thousand dollars less than several years ago 2016-17 and uh, that will number will change obviously with some of the with the news now the health insurance so i promised crystal I, I would keep this short she has an engagement uh, in her building as she does often so with that i will stop and uh, turn it back to ann and for the rest of the of the meeting so it's coming around right now. Um, CVAS has put together um, a demographic sheet just to share sort of the overview um, and then sort of, do you want me to stand sit? I feel super awkward right now. <laughs> <laughs> Join us to table. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what, give me a second to get it around here. There are a couple of extra boxes, but not anything too dramatic to, add, no, to the one that you guys already have. Um, <clears throat> you can see the class, the overall enrollment and our projected enrollment for next year is um, with 52 kindergartners is 355. So, and that changes weekly, but we, we're worried about 350 right now. Um, the demographics on the right, the top right there, um, is really what I want to focus on. So our Choices program is an in-house program um, for students with special needs, and that currently is at nine, and typically we run that at eight. So that program is quite successful, but you know we could probably use a few more spots in there, but right now that's where we're at. Um, currently of our paraprofessionals, I believe there are 21 at Lakeway, like, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but eight of them are one-to-one, -one, so their responsibility is specific to one student. Um, currently ESOL it makes up 6% of our total population. IEPs are 19%, which is a little high comparatively. 11% um, of our students are on a 504 plan, which is a plan that helps them um, typically with a medical need. Um, I was just going to say, if there are any abbreviations in there that yeah, I've been yeah. so you know, so Individual education plan, that's for students that um, require special education. Um, and ESOL is English speakers of other languages. Um, it used to be just ESL, but they added another letter in there. It used to be English as a second language. Yeah. 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 All the time. <laughs> that one gets me um, and then our free and reduced lunch numbers currently are at 51% of our buildings. What's a 504? A 504 plan, so if a student has ADHD and requires additional accommodations, but not necessarily support with work. Um, Do any of these have ankles? Are they um, all? Are they ESOL, ESOL might fall also in a 504 or an IEP, but 504 and IEP are separate. Separate, okay. <clears throat> Um, the next line, the kindergartners with no preschool, I started doing that last year because I noticed that we had a significant number of kindergartners entering the building with no preschool experience. And this year our population is 37% of our kindergarten group wow. has not had any preschool 
exposure. Um, and the reason I chose to share that piece of information is a kindergartner coming in with two years of preschool versus a kindergartner coming in with no years of preschool right. makes a significant challenge wow. for a kindergarten teacher. Um, you know, we have a lot, a lot of students that do go to preschool, many of them go to, the, to two years, and they come in being able to write their name, say their alphabet, write their letters and know their numbers, and then some students come in. And that's not true of all. That's not, I don't want to generalize any student that doesn't go to preschool because it's not always the case, but um, there is, there are some additional issues when we have that high of a number of students that have no exposure. And probably some difference from just not having gone to school. Right, right? I mean, just right, and just learning what a school day is like, yeah. you know. Um, all the area preschools run a typical traditional kindergarten model as far as carpet time and, and, and circle time and things of that nature. So learning those routines when other students have been doing it for two years is very different. Can I go back to the free and reduced lunch? Yep. That is significantly higher than most of the state. Can you give us any insight into that? Did you say um, IEP? No, no the free and reduced lunch. Gotcha. Um, I don't know, and, and I'm a little surprised that it stayed that high because last year they changed the percent or how you qualify. It became mm -hmm. a little bit more difficult to qualify. Um, part of Part of this, I think, is we do a really good job of getting this information out to parents, um, help them have lunch balance. Can you tell us what some of the things are that makes you qualify? I mean, I don't it's know. It's income what based. The yes. Number of family members <coughs> and income. It's and a formula that I don't totally understand. And homelessness. And homelessness. And homelessness. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, but we, you know, we have there. Can be lunch balance issues that we face, and sometimes it's because parents need help filling out the form. Um, we did have the form translated into Spanish, so we did a, a few other things to help support that system. So that may be a contributing factor to the increase in number. Um, other than that, but actually, yeah, you know what I'm saying, right? I think we're we were as high as 60 percent years ago. So yeah, it does fluctuate year to year. But we uh, do we receive additional uh, monies from the state for those students is in the formula? That. That's primarily what we get uh, lunch money for is for the free and reduced free or reduced students. So it, it's mostly mm -hmm. for the lunch. Yes, it's the part cost of, of the part lunch. Of the subsidy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Breakfast and lunch actually. Okay. USDA increases the income limits based on family size just about every year. Uh, it's, it's gone up again this year. It's in addition to being income based, there is also qualifications if uh, families on food stamps or other sort of support, uh, they can be automatically qualified. So it's Thank you. Um, so that, that I thought was just important <coughs> to share um, yeah. sort of the makeup of our building. So some of the challenges, you wanted me to discuss some of those. Um, behaviors, social emotional issues we've been dealing with. That was a big part of our presentation last year was that we are um, doing a better job district wide of addressing social emotional issues as a whole building. Um, an another issue that we've recognized at Lakewood, and I think Jen probably would share this, is transiency. We have a high number of families moving in and out on a regular basis. Um, so our attendance numbers fluctuate and sometimes they say exactly the same but eight kids came out and eight kids came in so that's been an issue that I've noticed that we've struggled with in the past couple of years. Crystal do we track as to why that may, may have happened? Um, we don't track the why we track the number Just the um, number. but it, it's a lot of moving between the you know the towns right around here. Um, so they might, so the other towns surrounding us are, must have the yep. same issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, my staffing is listed over there to the right. ESOL, we did add a, a position. So 1.3 means um, we have a person, we have two people in our building. Um, one works, is split between us and the high school, and the other one is a, a 0.8 position. Um, because we do have a higher number of ESOL students. Um, and the instructional approach looks like it was went down, but that actually is a position that's shared between the elementary school and the high school, so that that person didn't change, just the role is between both buildings. Um, what punch <coughs> instructional coach? So it's, I actually should have added curriculum coordinator, so she her responsibility is to coordinate um, 
what we're teaching, how we're teaching it, and when we're teaching it, K through 12. And she also coordinates the assessments, um, professional development, and support for teachers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, my overall budget is down. We went, you know, it was level funded. We went back through, and I found, you know, some places where I felt, you know, it wouldn't be detrimental to instruction to, to trim a little bit more. Um, so I sort of did a general trim at each grade level, but the way I create my budget, and I inherited this system, and it, it works, so I can have kept it. Um, each grade level does their budget as a grade level, and I assign them, for kindergarten, it's $85 per student, and so we use the NESDEC estimate of how many they anticipate we'll get. That has burned us a couple times, um, but it's the best number we have. Per day? No. no. For the, year. for the year. So $85 for the year for per anticipated incoming kindergartner. So so for example, we'd say that there are about 50 coming next year. So that's the number that kindergarten has to use for all of their ordering. So that's um, supplies, new equipment, replacement equipment, textbooks, library AV, and I added field trips into that. So their field trip budget has to come out of that same amount. Um, for grades one through six, uh, the number I use is $147. Um, and again, they get that amount of money times how many students we anticipate they're them having and everything they do, buy, and have comes out of that money. Um, and again, the field trips are rolled in for them too. At the specialist level, it's always level funded. So they, you know, within reason, are ordering very much the similar things year to year, you know, art, paint, paper, that sort of thing, same thing with PE. Um, and one thing that we do do a little differently, uh, we have what's called an admin miscellaneous, which is called what we call the mole hole budget. <laughs> so if you've ever been to Lakeway, there is a basement that is referred to as the mole hole, and that's where we um, have a mass amount of supplies that everybody orders, pencils, crayons, colored pencils, that thing. That sort of thing that everybody orders every year, we took that on as admin so that um, uh, Tara Doyle actually is the one that is responsible for doing it. She orders all of that <coughs> stuff in the entire building in bulk, so we save a little bit of money with ordering it in bulk and, and on shipping, and we dole it out of that mole hole so that they, can, they don't have to take as much out of their grade level budgets because we did ask them to absorb the field trip. So we you know, give and take a little bit to try to help everybody out. And controls um, your inventory better too. And controls the inventory. We, ha we added um, a request form that's electronic. So if a teacher's out of pencils or out of notebooks or what have you, they just submit that, the office gets it, it keeps a tally so we know exactly what we need, how much of what we're going through. So it just helps us streamline the ordering process a little bit better and, and allows us to um, share those costs a little more effectively. Um, and, in, and really everything else stays flat. We don't anticipate major new equipment needs. Um, one thing that's difficult for me to budget for is things that get broken because um, we do have a fair share of things that don't survive the school year. So that's one piece that we sometimes have to move a little bit of money um, to make up for it in the end because we break stuff. It gets used hard. And, um, so that was probably the area that I have the most difficulty planning a specific amount for. Um, but pretty much we're level across the board. Do you know for IEPs, do you know if the percentage for us as compared to maybe the state? It's a little higher. Usually they're running right around 12%. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. And the IEP is a pretty strict protocol and procedure before Very a student strict. is, do you say, awarded or certified or is put on the IEP yeah, program? Yeah, identified. There's a pretty intense process yeah. that families and students have to go through to qualify for an IEP. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but still we're half again as much as... Yeah. So the state. I mean, yeah. there's and some of the needs. So the reason I added how many one-to-one -one pairs. Those are students that require somebody with them the entire time mm -hmm. they're at yeah. school. So those are you know usually pretty significant <coughs> needs. So to have eight of those, it, that's a high number. Mm -hmm. that's a that high include number like numbers. physical needs. Like some have physical needs. Um, <coughs> emotional. Emotional needs. Speaking, feeding, toileting. It, they run the gamut. So I put that number in there this year because it is a little bit of an outlier. Um, 
So when people discuss staffing, so eight, eight of our staff are, are assigned to one child each. Mm -hmm. and yeah, that's for the para-professionals? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. And all of those are special ed parents. So I don't know. You're going to go over all of these. And are you going through the budget? What is the process? And are you going to go through the budget? Or is this just an so overview? Tonight, what we thought we'd have you hear from the, the principals and directors, give you some time. Because most of you haven't seen the, the, the big budget uh, in any kind of detail. We'll give you some time to review it. We'll be right back together again next week and mm -hmm. give you plenty of time to think of questions you might have and to submit so we can prepare the discussion. I, There's things we can certainly discuss and, and we may be able to answer. Okay, uh, so. Yeah. So I think maybe from all of the administrators, um, one thing, area that I would be interested in is you certainly know your students and your student needs and, uh, you know, and the educational component. These are just, this is what we have. This is a, like a student profile and a staffing profile. But for some of the um, math and English and reading, what are some of the needs that you have found via the testing, via just classroom observation, that you are incorporating into the budget? So one change that um, I didn't mention this because I, I have it written here is that so our Title I teachers that are grant funded, we, we noticed a need <coughs> in math. Um, so historically, the, those four people, three full-time, one part-time, there were three full-time reading Title I teachers and one part-time math. So we have changed that. So we now have two full-time um, Title one reading teachers and 1.8 um, math. Mm -hmm. So the person in that role has um, really taken off on math coaching too a little bit. Um, so one of our goal, our building goals is to increase our, our math test scores and our math proficiencies. And <coughs> she, she has sort of changed how we do business as far as we assess each incoming kindergartner now. And so we know at, at kindergarten registration, so we know coming in of the ones that register, mm -hmm. um, we can kind of ident pre identify them if they are a student in need. So she, for the last two years, she's been sort of getting us ahead of the eight ball with students that are coming in a little lower. Um, and that's in just the one year has made a significant difference. Um, so over time with her, the, the goal is that she's currently working K through two. So the goal is that by the time they get to that state assessment in third grade, they have really been inundated with those math supports um, prior to getting there. And so, so far that has been proven to be very successful. That's one of our big goals. The other one is social emotional learning. So we started the Choose Love curriculum this year in all classrooms. Um, and that sort of helped students cope with stressors and anxiety and, and kind of get ahead of some of the behaviors that are impacting the academics. Um, and then also this year, the third big thing that we've been doing is the competency-based um, learning. And we already had a standards-based report card, so transitioning to the competency-based report card hasn't been as big of a challenge for us. Um, the system, working in the electronic system is the challenge. Um, but with the instructional coach, curriculum coordinator, instructional coach, um, She's really been working hard with our staff on developing um, assessments and rubrics and really working on the cl actual classroom instruction and how that looks at each grade level and how we um, meet the needs of all learners because they don't learn all the same way. So those are our three big things and we did discuss those last year, but one of our biggest goals this year is decreasing behaviors, the overall number of behavior reports, um, which we've cut by 50% as, to, as since Halloween, I checked it up to Halloween. So, because um, that's usually our good benchmark of how we're doing. <laughs> um, and increasing our math scores. So those are my two big things this year. And then um, there's always staff development mm -hmm. at each grade level. I can't remember how many days of staff development we have. We have six. Six days mm -hmm. of staff development. And obviously, some of it is um, from the SAU directive um, down, but also it, some must come from the building um, I administrators. Think Steve's done a nice job of letting us um, stick with the big three of UVL, CBE, and SEL, a bunch of letters. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, but we've been able to focus our district wide efforts on those same things, so we're not, you know, kind of on offshoots. Um, 
And we even have been doing our um, monthly faculty meetings around those same three things so that we're constantly going back to what we're already doing and providing development. Um, Steph Wyman, she used to be Steph Bronson, is the, we have coined her our math guru, and she provides weekly math um, professional development, and she's taken some courses to be able to teach how to teach math better. Um, and we set those up on top of those other days. Um, the, the floating staff development days are, are being used up with that. Um, but Steve's been gracious enough to let us use those days for what we're already working on. So it's been really, really helpful. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think that uh, you know the, the the big three that Crystal mentioned, and it's those are three with like uh, three hundred <coughs> moving parts with each one. I think sometimes our, the teachers are they're under a lot of a lot of stress right now. But I think you know to follow up on that, we don't we most of most of what we do is building based when it comes to professional development. It's aligned between the two buildings and it's program based. But uh, we have some times when we're together K twelve or something. Times that's advantageous, but most of the time that's not what we do. It's more driven by the building and the needs of the building because they're they're different. They're, they're very different. Well, I think that and we're interested in finding out too how mm -hmm. it's you know coordinated K through 12, and yeah. and then also every once in a while there are just um, math books or math programs that have to be you know. Um, I guess updated or right. reading programs and so are we doing any of that or is there a need for that because those can be quite expensive you know right in the so we we are shifting away from teaching um, a kit and going to teaching the competencies so sometimes that means um, the traditional textbook and teacher edition are, are not necessarily what we utilize anymore um, we have our set of competencies that our vertical team has worked on, so we know what we're teaching <coughs> when. And then the how is different based on student needs sometimes. Um, we do have, like for example, we have a math curriculum and we have a language arts curriculum, but we're not necessarily teaching that canned curriculum, we're teaching to the competencies. Mm -hmm. um, so it's actually a cost savings for as far as that goes, because you're not buying a new set of workbooks every year. I mean, we do have math workbooks, but we're not having to update the math text every five years. or So we don't really have that sort of curriculum anymore. And a lot of it's on technology. So we are one-to-one -one first grade through 12th grade. Um, and there's a lot of technology access um, that we use for different programming. So we aren't looking at buying any new canned curriculums. Yeah. Two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, your uh, Title I 3.8 mm -hmm. positions, it says grant funded. Yeah. Do they, is that all those positions are grant all, funded? All of the 3.8 is grant and funded. And do they, do they, is the grant just for the salaries or are they also for the benefits? Salaries and benefits. So, the, so we the get whole that. Thing is, paid is that something that just is continuing like that? Yep. Good. Hopefully. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that it isn't so. That one's been around a long, long time. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and we our 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 grant fluctuates a little bit, but uh, it's we've carried over. We haven't we, we do have the ability to carry over in, in only for a year. So we've always had a little bit of a of a of a cushion there in case our allocation would would lower. Or he has some other kind of unex unexpected expenses, but uh, that one, that one, in our special ed grants have been pretty, pretty constant. It's good. And for over a long period of time, so we're pretty careful with our other grants, not using them for personnel, be because we know what happened, the history of that. But uh, for that, for that different grant, it's it's a little bit pretty stable. Uh, Title One this year, our allocation is three hundred fifty-nine thousand two hundred and twenty-four dollars. By the way, three hundred sixty thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. For three point, almost four employees. Mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty. That's that's good on both sides, I think. As yeah, far as yeah. uh, we get, that's a bargain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another question on your behavior. You say your behavior instances went down fifty percent. Mm -hmm. Up to this point, we still uh, no. a lot of year ago, but. <coughs> and, uh, <laughs> And what factors did that? Because I see two things happening. That increases the uh, teachability of the class and the students themselves and reduces stress on the teachers. Yeah. So what factors went into that that brought that down, do you think? So 
Well, when I we have a system called Swiss that we track our behavior data, and I'm a data person, so geek, but. Um, and we had a significant number of behavior referrals last year, so it was my personal goal to share with the staff, and I think they agreed when I shared the data, um, that we had to do something at the tier one level, so that means everybody's doing it, um, to change that. And so we implemented the Choose Love curriculum, which is a free curriculum that I think the a majority of the state is following now um, for social emotional behaviors. And we've also implemented um, an additional program called Second Step that our guidance and behavior um, specialist, our behavior coach implement on behalf of the classrooms, also K through six. Um, and we're really trying to beef up how we approach student behavior and student learning and to sort of get ahead of that with these programs and, and teach students how to cope and how to deal with frustration in an appropriate manner. Um, it's not that you can't be mad, but there are things you can't do when you're mm -hmm, mad. Mm -hmm. And just sort of giving them that language and increasing the comfort for the other students in the classroom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, having the Choices program helps us with those students that have significant behavioral mm -hmm. needs. Um, so that that's really important. But I think the staff has bought into this. Um, they have seen the results. It's not perfect. We still have behaviors, but mm -hmm. seeing a 50% decrease in the behaviors is really positive. Mm -hmm. I think so. Uh, too. Feel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Crystal. You, know, <laughs> <laughs> you can go to your thing <laughs> there. That's, that's good. good. <laughs> I thought you were going to combust there for a moment. <laughs> that's right. It's just Jennifer. Yeah. You're next, David Watson, Gorgeous. Yeah. All right. So I'll give you the demographic cover sheet. It is three pages. The first page is David Watson Middle School. I wanted to introduce you to the Above the Notch Community School. And then there's um, kind of a budget summary. Kind of, you can see the course offerings. You can see what we see. Um, that's what we end. That's what we send with our transcripts off to um, colleges. So, um, the enrollment. Well, the enrollment numbers. You can see about 14% of our students across grade seven to 12. <coughs> have IEPs, 12% have 504s, and then about six, that's consistent with our elementary school, have um, ESOL supports in place. Um, Jennifer, for the um, camera, for the people that are viewing at home, can yes. you kind of just go over the enrollment? That's oh, yep, our enrollment. enrollment um, yeah. We have 354 students in our school. Um, the large classes are 7th grade at 70 and 10th grade at 70. Our 8th grade um, and 9th grade are 40, 47 to 50. We're going to be graduating about 59 students this year. When we do have graduates, last year's graduates, 43% of them went on to four-year schools. 28% of them went on to two-year schools, and then five into the military, five percent into the military. Twenty-two went off to work, and two percent um, did not have a plan when they left. How well, does that? Excuse me. How does that figure on um, the statewide level? On the state average, it's pretty spot on for our our area, mm -hmm. and it's actually a little high for Coas, and about right on with Grafton. These are uh, pretty good figures, I would think. Yeah. Are they? They. they I would think so. 
So considered, you know. You've got to bring, and I wish I had that number. I didn't bring it. But at Skull, at Skull, we have a community who truly supports our seniors and our graduates. We, do you remember the number? $290,000 in scholarships were given out at our class night, um, not including the arts pro additional funding that they receive after graduation that we hear about later. So we have a strong community supporting our graduates and their futures. We have also have a strong internship program, so they are able to find out what they really want to do beforehand. We get students in internships who decide that's not their line of work. So they're able to shift instead of going to school, deciding after a year that they, this isn't for them. So, and those internships are supported by all our area businesses and organizations who take our students in. Um, our middle school free and reduced lunch rate is 30, about 36%, 37% currently, and our high school is 32. So it was significantly higher yes. at the elementary. Is there there's a, there's kind of a reason for that? I mean, the difference, how it drops. Yeah, high school students often don't. I mean, they, Chris will talk about forms and, and communicating that to the families and those routines to give that information back. Our um, high schoolers just don't, they won't eat, or they, you know, they don't always return the forms. So those numbers are not probably reflective of the true population. And that would be true across the state in a lot of communities. We are doing a better job. Um, um, with the support of um, Michelle Cox, she's been helping us kind of make sure the families that we believe there's a need for get the documents that they need to submit to, to apply for that. People who might have account charges and not able to pay, we're working with them. Okay, that's good. And, and I was just thinking that there, if there's um, siblings in the elementary school, it's easier to follow up um, to those students in the upper grades, but there are some that don't have younger exactly. siblings. Yeah. Um, our current, any questions about the demographics? Our current staffing? Um, just, uh, yeah. you're going on staff. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, we're hoping to maintain our current staff, staffing. Our, our um, classroom teacher is 21 and a half. We have a librarian. Um, one regular ed para, a distance learning, learning support center. Um, par, you'd call it a para. Student counselor, we have 1.5. The other half is an SAP coordinator. The guidance secretary, nurse, receptionist, administrative assistant. We have a 0.5 ESL teacher we share with Lakeway and a 0.5 ESL para supporting our students in our school, middle school building. A safety truancy officer and two administrators. Our, our average classroom size is 15. How does the English speakers of a second, how does, how does that work? So at the high school, middle school? Yeah, well, I think. So there's, they have um, classes built into their schedule to support them with their current work, as well as develop their, their writing skills, um, their language skills, uh, their reading skills when they're looking at understanding different content areas that are, are uh, more of a challenge. So they've got that vocabulary building mm -hmm. support there as well. Um, some of the ASOL support goes into the classroom with them, but more often than not, it's beyond beyond the, the classroom and in their space. And and how many languages are we talking? Um, currently, there's just it's predominantly Spanish, yeah. Yeah. which obviously makes it yeah. hopefully easier that yeah. you can focus on the one. But I mean, yeah. if you they do have others, we do have others. Yeah, yeah. the um. In, when Crystal was talking about the transient population, we're seeing specifically this year an increase of students coming from other parts of the country yeah. to our community. So that's a little bit different for yeah. us uh, and the surrounding areas. But we yeah, but I mean, obviously, that's going to be quite a challenge. I mean, mm -hmm. on, on both ends. Yeah, the ESOL support also 
includes work done with, maybe they don't come into the classroom, but they're monitored and supported and conversations happen with those students to ensure that they've got what they need um, course-wise or, or if they're achieving their grades or if they are looking at colleges or not sure what they're going to do, so there's some of that support happening too. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, um, can you, or do you have uh, an idea of how the average class size compares with Grafton County? No. Uh, no. Or, um, or, or, when you, maybe have yeah, that number Yeah, I, I do actually. Um, and this is, you take the, get the best data that you can, and I, I usually try to, I try to use the state site. And we, and we, and sometimes we run, we get a little trouble here because the state will, will, will present it one way and we'll present it another way and then and someone else will present it another way. So I just did the simple math. I went in and, and used the, the state reports, looked at how many students are in, are in these schools and how many teachers are they showing on their staffing report and simply divided it. And uh, I don't know if that's a great, if that's great methodology, my, my college statistics teacher, I can hear her yelling at me. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, there's, there's uh, and, I, and I did look at Grafton County in total, I looked more about in the North Country, although I did a, a couple of other uh, schools that were around the state. Uh, we're, we're well within staffing norms in, in the North Country. We, we have uh, fewer students per teacher uh, in the high school level than a place like Berlin. Uh, we have, we have uh, more students per teacher than some of our closest neighbors, uh, Profile, Lisbon, uh, to name a few. The regional uh, has slightly bigger class sizes. Plymouth has slightly bigger class sizes. So you know, I guess I did throw one in from uh, Grafton County Hanover, I think. Which I'm not sure how much they have in common with us other than Grafton County. Uh, not surprisingly, their class sizes are a little bigger. They are in a building, Steve. So. <laughs> yeah, they're kind of, you know, they're, 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 but, they, but to, you, and again, it's, it's an interesting, you start looking at some economies of scale mm -hmm. here, too, of course. And, and Conway, for instance, those class sizes are somewhat larger also, and, and, but that's an economy of scale driver as well that we don't necessarily are they will take advantage of. Now, I think one thing programmatically that uh, that we're doing is not going to make that look any better is that we're 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 we have some classes with three four kids in them. Mm -hmm. They're called AP. We've added some AP. We've added some advanced courses. We hope to build the interest and build the enrollment in those as we as we raise the rigor uh, of, of our college bound college prep program. But those doing that also tends to create uh, obviously some skewed numbers in terms of class sizes. Thank you. Yeah. And I do and I do have those I do have those numbers I can look on my spreadsheet I can give you a number based on my methodology for what that's worth as well. So at the elementary school I believe they said that they had 21 um, paras and eight were one on one out of that. And how many pairs do you have at your? That's all those report. That's report. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So um, that's that's fine. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Jim, or maybe Tom, what is the figure of the budget? Are we at this point now? I can ask a question. Well, I, think I was going to go to that. One go right ahead. Right Just press on. So that you, I want to kind of. Actually, talk about this first. Press on. <laughs> okay. So, little the school profiles here it includes so that you can just see a little bit about our grading practices. Um, I don't spend a lot of time. I know you want to get to the numbers, uh, but yeah, under no, this is great. <laughs> but under the um, the curriculum on one of the ins on the inside of pages, I wanted you to see the variety of course offerings that we have. Um, it's on the right hand side curriculum you'll see that that we have about nine running start classes that our teachers teach. When I say running class, it means they're, they're duly enrolled in White Mountain Community College and earning college credit as well as high school credit. Um, so currently, we have nine classes. Alice, some of the CTC teachers are teaching them. And we have um, currently doubled our AP offering. So we've got two AP courses, but we've trained, we have four trained AP teachers, chemistry, um, Spanish, um, 
world history and uh, English com college composition are running our not our uh, AP English sorry our AP offerings. What's great about getting our teachers trained in teaching AP is that it shifts their mindset across all the courses they're teaching. So they approach things uh, through a different lens, uh, different um, writing tasks, different assessment measures, things that are uh, richer, d deeper understanding than before having that AP training. Uh, we've also increased some of the, the um, gaps we see with as what are your challenges in math. So we've, we've <coughs> cut back and realigned some of our course offerings to make sure our kids are, are building in specific content in math before getting to that algebra class. So they have a pre-algebra. They, they, they now have a um, pre-algebra and then that basic algebra and basic geometry to build mm. up some of the weaknesses in math. And it seems to be working well. We'll see. That was this year. So we'll see as, as testing goes on, um, addressing them where they are. Um, I, w I was looking at the math scores on the mm -hmm. state site. And for, I think, 11th grade, it was only 24% at proficiency and above. Um, so I was a little startled at that. So that was those are the reasons why yeah. I asked, oh, you know, know, what are you trying to do to address So we've, those we've things. added some of those different level courses. Um, and we, last year, we implemented our, ta our te teacher and student collaborative time, a 40 minute period of time at the end of the day um, for direct support with the students that are either in need enrichment, the higher level enrichment opportunities in different disciplines, as well as the interventions and supports in the moment when they need it to make sure they're at that grade level. So we, we're working with that um, approach as well, building it into the school. Because they're not, oftentimes students don't have the time to come after school because of everything. So to build it in there is... It's like office hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we schedule them specifically yes. with different teachers right. and, and everybody has an opportunity to do either the enrichment or <coughs> So does anything, um, are there any, I guess, uh, things that you're addressing through staff development or? Yeah, we're, we're, we're focusing on um, the same things Crystal is. We've, we've, there's behavioral issues and concerns still as it would be across any school. So the social emotional learning with the Choose Love curriculum is taking place at the high school, middle school as well during the one day a week of our task opportunities. Um, the district as a whole did some restorative justice practice, restorative practices, um, professional development. A little bit different ways to approach students who are experiencing trauma or students that um, come from uh, different, different challenges in their past and their present. So we're working on some of that. Do you feel that, I think you just changed, how many years have you been on the new block scheduling? This is the second year, second year on the every the other day. Every other every day. day. Which extent, I was going to mention that earlier. It means yeah. they have math all year, or any, all the disciplines all year, unless it happens to be a half year PE or health course. Um, as opposed to semester-based, which could <coughs> leave a gap of a whole year before getting back to that discipline again. Mm -hmm. So this is the second year that we've yeah. been on that. I wanted to bring that up because yes, I do you. feel I do feel it's very important. Um, you know, right? Mm -hmm. like, Jim's class when he was going through school yeah. um, in graduating in 1999. <laughs> <I'm gonna> <laughs> <laughs> as an example. <laughs> 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 but Jim's class, um, I think when they were juniors in high school, that's when they started the new block scheduling, but it was four by four. Yeah. And so we kind of went through all of the, you know, the, the learning process of how to schedule classes through that. And we just recently changed. But I used to um, look at the SAT scores up until then. So when he was taking, when his class was taking the SAT uh, test, junior and senior year, um, they still had that 
um, seven block or seven period day so they were going through they had the math every day or, or they had it through the year and then it was sequential it was better um, and after that when the kids got further out from you know having that Daily. continuity and the, <coughs> and the sequence the SAT scores actually started to drop significantly so I've always been like, the okay, thing, where are we on yeah, this? I, the other thing to remember about the SAT scores is that um, not everybody's been required to take them in the past. Right. And when the state made that shift to uh, the SAT being the 11th grade state assessment, it's going to give us a better measure of everything. Of everything. And this will be a third year? Right, and, but, that, but there was quite a few years, a decade, so to, so to speak, that um, it wasn't required of right. everyone. It was just those that were going exactly. off to college. So and yet the SAT high. scores were going down, and I, was, I really felt yeah. it was because there you know, was a disruption in sequence. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm glad that we're kind of addressing that. that. That was, in hindsight, that was a mistake that a lot of us have to take responsibility for, and I think I think the main reason for the mistake was that a lot of us had our collegiate careers most recently in mind, and, and it worked there. And it worked, <laughs> and it worked there. That's right. But you know, the reality you're, now you're going to have one of those da moments. I mean, obviously, it should have been very obvious to us that it's a different process, and you know, I had to do it all. But it only took us how many years to correct it? I right? know. Yeah, which is right. so. So going back to testing, and I know you'll address it. I'll just throw it out here, and you'll say I'm going no, to address no, that no. later on. Um, so I going through the test scores, the SAT for 11th grade, and the, the testing that we have. Science is that going to be tested for the first time now? Science um, has been tested. Has it been tested? Yeah, it's not ever shared out at the state level, but we have our science assessment. State on the state reports out on. Reading and math. That's right. That's um, why I was wondering. But we've been testing science for several years. Several, several Fourth, years. eighth. Um, eighth and uh, eighth and eleventh. We stopped at eleven okay. for a little bit, um, and that hasn't come back yet. Yeah, fourth and eighth. Fourth, eighth, and then it was eleventh, but not now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, anything else about testing? <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot. Oh, well. There is a lot. There is a lot. I'm going to go through my notes to make sure I've got it. Yeah. Um, the second sheet, and look at the budget lines at the bottom, I, um, and the second sheet is above the notch. You know, for many years, for many years, we have had um, a learn program. The students who are finding limited success in, in a traditional classroom. Um, impacting the learning of others or not being able to engage their, in their own learning. Uh, we had an after-school evening program called Learn where they were online and they did their coursework online. And it worked at the time we started that, probably six years ago, and we found that our kids were not finding the growth that they needed to. Um, they were falling behind, they weren't achieving their credit, uh, so we really needed to reflect on what could we do. So Greg, Greg and I spent much of the start of last, last year trying to figure out those, those lost um, students, and we d were able to, fortunate enough, to develop Above the Notch Community School. It's an, it's an, uh, an adult high school diploma program. And if you look, there's on the second sheet above the Notch Community School sheet talks a little bit about um, the challenges we faced with a program that was serving a population of our students. Um, the the um, Littleton communities changed over the, the past 10, 15 years. Um, family, families have changed. Um, values change. Um, and in previous years, 30% of our students who graduate were not attending post-secondary schools. Um, so we, a, a, 
approach things as the state's been encouraging um, for many years, 10 years now, co a competency-based program, project-based program to engage these learners who were online and um, not finding the success. Uh, so we establish Above the Notch. It's an adult program. It's a community school. Our enrollment this year is currently, I think it just went up two, but 23 students. We have two students with IEPs, two with 504s. Um, two are tuitioned in from other communities. Um, when I sit down at principal meetings, every every school, every school principal that I've talked to, there's a population of students you, you're unable to reach and you just um, don't have the programming or the ability in your school to provide it. So we, we figured out a way to offer that in our school. So um, the brochure I gave you gives you kind of the outline, the highlights, the course requirements, uh, the fees that are charged, um, attendance policies, schedules. It's, it's really an opportunity for those students and we're, we're seeing tremendous success. The students that we just didn't know what to do with it were not earning credits, are engaged in their learning, producing great projects, um, doing they've got jobs as part of the of the uh, as part of the program. Um, so, so what is the youngest that somebody would be in this program? Sixteen. Um, so on the we have uh, for credit recovery, fifteen year old taking course, sixteen year olds. Um, we have. 35, you know, we've got adult learners too that dropped out of school that have come back mm -hmm. um, to earn their diploma and for their, you know, their kids are in the house and they're going to school. So it's been, it's been a positive in our community. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's the above the notch community mm -hmm. school. And, and, and in May, we're hoping to graduate 15 students, our first class of 15 students. So this kind of takes a place or supplements the GED program? There's still that. It's not. It's called the um, high set now. Yes. Um, but this is just where they go back and catch the ones that they didn't do. The high set, um, they they pass the. They've got tests to pass. Right. But this is this more is structured class time yeah, um, through the week, and they earn it um, through demonstrating the competencies and participating in project based. Yeah. Practical learning. approach. Yeah. A practical yes. Exactly for those for those learners. Mm -hmm. Tell them what I got to do. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. So that we well, let's not talk money now. <laughs> <laughs> but that program at the bottom um, had it's significantly all of the teachers are stipends, um, and that's grant funded. So we, there's we've got adult grant, adult program grant that's funding our, um, the teachers for that program. The, the uh, and if you guys can certainly jump in when we talk about the above the notch, the district uh, anticipates a $60,000 um, budget, but that also includes the direct, the uh, coordinator for the program, but also grant writing, um, support for the district, because I, we recognize the fact that we do need to look more and more at grants to help offset some of the things that we need that we can't. Um, so tell me, how, how is this, what, what's the day? I mean, the hours of the so day? So the day, yeah. so students have two and a half hour classes once a week for 15 weeks. Um, there's two classes offered each day, Monday through Thursday. They are, some of them are choosing to earn some work-based credit. So they've got their job, they, they um, bring in their pay stubs, they work with a coordinator to get jobs. So that supports there for them as well. And um, there's a senior project before they graduate, that self-design mm -hmm. in the classrooms. Um, the teachers are the facilitators of the learning. They've got the, the um, competencies defined in multiple ways for them to demonstrate those competencies. 
So they, it, this is after after school hours. after school it's hours definitely yeah. And then yeah so they can work during the day and they yes. can still make it yes. to and that's that to cool. class yeah she supports them in finding those jobs because they do need to be doing yes so you have 15 graduates yes right and they will receive a diploma and above the notch Diploma. Community school diploma part. And we have to, and our, and your budgeting, the, the taxpayers have to come up with sixty thousand dollars to f their part of that. Those fifteen. We've we've built into our budget that position. Yeah. Okay, so for four thousand dollars per student, we get a student with a, the diploma. It's a great bargain. It's a great bargain. They get out and they because if you, if you don't have a diploma, sometimes you can't get a job. So is it the same type of diploma? I mean, I know we have different it's an, diplomas. It's an adult. It's a state. And, and it's okay. adult. acknowledged like any other high school diploma? Yeah. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, the interesting thing about this for me and for our community is the potential for students to be tuitioned in from other schools at, at um, Five hundred dollars a class. So if they come and they take all their class, you know, twenty credits, twenty classes, that's another way to help offset some of the cost for this. Yeah. Tom, tell me I'm using the wrong vocabulary. <laughs> so it's called gross appropriation. So okay. it comes in as revenue, yeah. but it sure. doesn't show. But still, it. it's a great option for those other it towns. Is. Yeah. It do. is because there's other. People living in other fantastic. communities, if I just got my diploma, or right. and it's a, and it's in a time period where they can have a job and still take. Yeah. yeah. The way it's structured now, every dime that comes in just lowers the tax rate. Yeah. It goes in, okay. it goes into the revenue. Okay. Okay. But we're not we're not talking about 15 students. We're talking about possibly 15 families. This yeah. is just not the student. It's their families and their yeah. spouses. It's a great impact. Yeah. So yeah. you explain a little bit about I mean the Monday through Thursday, but yeah. so do they? But they don't come every. Not, not every person well, comes have, every. So the, they they don't come every day for every class because they are all working on different course requirements to meet the diploma. So on the front page they need four English, two science, but definitely a biology. So um, the coordinator sits down, looks at all the students each semester all the courses that they need to have to progress and then, then yeah. she builds the t the population of teachers the certificate certifications the courses that need to be required yeah. to support them in their ultimate goal so it's very personalized that's right so i mean you, got, you figure out the, the demand and you figure the resources that's you have exactly. and then allocate it amongst the four days to make it happen yeah, yeah we're and we're working with the board is talk to the board about this a little bit we are going to uh, Establish a, an advisory committee for this program, to, and because th this is kind of a this is a stepping out a little bit. This is moving into that. I don't want to go so far as to say school choice realm, but it's moving into that consumer-driven uh, area a little bit, tailored to the needs of the of the, of the student, very much driven by their schedule, uh, their you know, and and and. The, the critical piece of this, and and Jennifer's heard me say it a hundred times, is is uh, is that we want we want to build relationships in the community with some of these students. So a key piece of this is yes, they come in there and they take the classes, but us helping them find a mentor, a somewhat a job in some cases. Rochelle's done that as well, because it, because many of our young adults and they're they're. A, high school age or shortly just out of high school, didn't finish the diploma, they, they need that strong presence in their life. We know that. That's, that's critical to many, many people. And most people in this room can probably think of someone along the line that guided them or cared about them or helped them. And many of us said it was our parents. Uh, we, we were lucky. We were lucky we had parents like that, but we know not everybody has that, that luxury. So. Yeah, we we're pretty we're pretty excited about this. It's it's a it's a work in progress, uh, but we've got some good results. We've got some great testimonials from students already, and, uh, and it's, it has I think a tremendous amount of potential for I think really helping helping this community. 
it's actually life altering yeah. for these kids. Mm -hmm. We want we want this. we want to help them yeah. live in Littleton, work in Littleton, pay taxes in Littleton. That's that's what this is. Well, that's not all this is about. But right. that's it, what it I, gives I, them I a want. Future. I mean, this mm -hmm. is yeah. give people the skills so they can stay here. Get mm -hmm. get the the, college, the high school degree. And these these are not. We're making we're making mm -hmm. connections with them with community college. We got some of these students that are going to be taking community college, college courses, which they never dreamed would ever happen because they were not college material, quote unquote. You know, you know the the day of throwaway students are over. And we've got to take care of them and, and get them in a position where they can live here and be productive or wherever else they want to live. But mm -hmm. I can't imagine they wouldn't want to live here. I think it's important to talk about. The one student who we already know is going to come back to us next year, who struggled last year, had some issues, moved away, came back into this program, is, is doing really well, and already wants to come back to the regular ed program next year. So it's not something that they, they can't come back either. Sometimes they just need to step out, have some success, and figure it out. So we already are projecting one to come back. That's great. And they're not, and there's some blending. You know that that's the piece of it too. Uh, there's some blending. They could they could get some of it through this program. They could get some of it through a regular program. It's it's a it's a it's a different. It's a it's a it's very choice driven and almost menu driven in that sense, driven by the student and or family. So one thing we're also working on in our schedule and that mindset is we look at a population of students 16 to 18 that this is a perfect program for. There's got to be something perfect when they're in that middle school years too. So that's something we're looking at. Not, not so much another program as much as how can we with our current resources better structure ourselves to support students. And the funding came from things that we used to spend money on for students like this. At did certainly Jennifer mentioned those, but uh, the, the, that sixty thousand dollars of general fund money was being spent in these types of efforts that unfortunately weren't as successful. That we're no longer spending those dollars on uh, the, the things that didn't work for us. They were spending it instead on something that clearly is working at this point. So it wasn't a um, an addition in that sense. A quick question on the. Uh if, if a 14 or 15 year old or 15 year old comes in, how long are they in the program before they, if they pass each class? It really, it depends on what they come in with. So um, yeah, we may they, say, say they, they come in with anything. Then, they, then it would take them, a they need 20 years, credits. Two years? Two years? Okay. Depends on their pace, you know. And, yeah, sure, that sure, but say they, they showed up to. to every available class, you know, that would be. The last sheet, and if you have I don't know if you did a much older student who decided to come back. Yeah, I think our older student is 50, 54. It's a sense of pride. It is. Yes. Mm -hmm. So nice to, and, and it, this, the students who may not have found that success in a traditional classroom space is in a, in a mature environment mm -hmm. with adult learners and they recognize their own worth. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's pretty amazing to yeah, see. I was in class yesterday, it's a very interesting <laughs> dynamic. Well, I mean, you, Anne probably remembers this, and probably Millie. We had one of the, um, at our graduation, we had a, a veteran that came back. Mr. Hebert. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I, I can't rem remember that. Yeah. And I mean, so that's how important a yeah. diploma is to people. Yeah. He went into the service, yeah. into the war. Yeah. He had a reason it was World War Two. World War Two. <laughs> and, and when he came home, he couldn't go back into the school system, but he didn't have his diploma. So yeah. he I finally... He was about 80 when he, he was 80 <laughs> when he got his diploma. <laughs> was, <laughs> but he was a very smart guy. Oh, yeah. 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 So and uh, so just, just a quick piece, we received a call about a month ago from his nephew who is establishing a scholarship in his name. Yeah. Awesome. Nice. Wow. Yeah. I remember yeah. how, what it, how, neat, from good things. Yeah, how neat it was for a senior to do the walk with him up yeah. to the stage. It was, it was wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
who would have okay. who would have thought he didn't graduate from high school? Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. So I, I this is a document that'll help you see what departments, what each of our departments' budgets look like. Um, I want I I know you have the the you've got the chunky. Right. Then you're probably going to go through it and look at the increases and decreases and have questions about that. Um, this is this particular sheet's nice to see the enrollment numbers, and you'll see that some of the enrollment numbers are higher than the number of students that we have in our school, and it's because they take multiple classes um, with teachers that are assigned to that department. Um, try to give you an idea of the total number of teachers per department. And then the budget, as it's, it's evolved since 2015-16 school year. So you can kind of see where we're falling. Um, when you talk about budget, what, like uh, English, six thousand. Yes. What what's included in that? So that would be their their supplies, their books. Just like their, the yeah, uh, just and it it's like the elementary school. Right? Yeah, it was, yes. Eighty five dollars per student. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> um, the one thing that's different in our budget is we do have a separate separate field trip. I mean, they are assigned to departments as well, but I did not include that there because I know sometimes field trips <coughs> is a hot topic. Um, I wanted to make sure you saw what that, for good or bad. <laughs> what that I looks always like, think. You know what I mean? I always think field trips are really important. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, I think sometimes it's the only exposure that some of these students mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. um, outside of the community. It, yeah. for, just for field trips for a minute, um, it used to be a big pool of, of funds and then it was pulled to the department specific to kind of let them know what they have to budget so they're going to plan a trip. Um, so we've only got from 2017, 2018 here for you, but I, there is an increase. Um, at a recent board meeting, we talked about opportunities for younger students to go out into the uh, do college visits as a grade level. We do it with our seniors, we do it with our juniors. Um, what if we did it with our sophomores? Well, what if we had some of those other opportunities there? So being mindful of that. Um, we also have a growing um, YLTA. It's Youth Leadership Through Adventure group that just presented to me about the conference I just came back from with such energy. Um, so the opportunity to send them on trips like that also come from those line items. Yeah, the, obviously, there's, in general, there's been a rather significant decrease. decrease. Yeah. And is that, I guess I'm hoping, is it because of technology that we're... Some of it is. Some of it is. And, and I think it's... Um, well, let me, let me tell you about the process yeah, that I went through to, to get to this. We started, I met with each department leader, um, each vertical team leader um, who manages their budgets. They worked with their departments and came to me and we went through their current budget and what were their needs. Some of the needs were new books or resources, not just books, but resources for the courses that were newly developed. Um, or, um, increasing in size and our language. Mm -hmm. So I had those conversations and then um, shared with the board with them. We did a three-year analysis and, and what's actually being spent and some of those adjustments take into account um, some of the three-year expected spendings was able to give us a decrease or adjustment. Right, because sometimes I, I would go through the budget and I would see that for three years no one used that money in that line item but it was just there every year yeah. and and I'm going why you know <laughs> we can yeah. look at it that yeah. <laughs> the, other, the other thing I, I realized going through the budget it was this my second year first year was tough tough but yeah. going through their budget and looking at like supply line items and knowing that you've got student enrollment numbers you have the number of teachers and then you've got some of the same supplies purchased across different departments and a discrepancy in amounts. So I was able to come up with a way to make that more equitable um, for the departments that were not heavy on supplies like our science department, there's the labs and our art department. So I was able to kind of make that a little bit more equitable for our teachers. Um, a, a few highlights as you go through 
through this document. Um, you would, s I don't know, I don't want to go through that big right. but but so that you're aware, some of the decisions, um, there's been an increase in some supplies for art and our, our ESL program. Mm -hmm. um, math books and so math classes and um, some social studies classes will have an increase in resources, mm -hmm. books, mm -hmm. textbooks. Mm -hmm. Um, not much like two thousand dollars so we're not looking at a huge I mean, overall budgets a decrease um, I know that our physical education department our fitness room equipment is um, getting old and they do need to replace a piece of equipment so that's in their budget under replacement of equipment <coughs> gifted and talented field trips that's where that increase came mm -hmm. from because of looking at that population um, you'll see a, a decrease in our gifted and talented tuition based on what we've been using in the past so it's a five thousand dollar decrease um, that's when students go off to st paul's or some summer learning opportunities or and and they're not doing so i looked at the three-year trend and we did make some adjustments there not so much that we can't support it but just so that it's more realistic and if you had the demand, you would yep. find we'd it. Find I would, it. Yeah. yeah, and we'd come back and have to increase it for the following year. That right. But even, within, but even within the year, yeah. most likely you could do a lateral. And the tighter and tighter our budgets get, yeah. that's tougher. But yes, it's tougher. Yeah, I mean, but certainly, it's going to be an effort. That's what I mean. If, yeah. if you had a kid who really qualified and really wanted to do it, we're going to find a way to make it happen. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of line items that you'll see as you go through it's like you'll if it's the first time you're going through the budgets it'll be like miscellaneous or other expenses um, and under the other expenses for administration it, it's seven thousand dollars but a lot of that I mean this I could go through uh, academic awards there um, professional development and trying to support teachers by arranging coffee in the morning. So there's, not that that's something you think adds up to 7,000, but um, new teachers, new teacher orientation supplies, um, North Country Scholars, the breakfast, so some of the graduation expenses, um, e equipment in the main office, uh, uh, movies that we're looking at, like Screenagers we purchased in the Resilience video we just showed. So some of those things come out of that, the things that you just don't, don't know where to put a value on. It's there. Right, and, uh, yeah. Extracurricular activities. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just was looking where in this spreadsheet that you have here with athletics. Happen? Athletics, okay. Yeah, so that's, that was the way I tabbed it here, co-curricular. Okay. Okay. Um, some of our co-curricula that are not athletic, I've been pulling from gifted and talented. Like, um, yeah, I I guess I have like two basic questions. You may not want to answer them tonight. Today, that's, that's fine, fine. but it will help me not forget them. So, um, so we're talking about. Um, yesterday when we met with um, the superintendent and then also Mel has brought this topic up once before is uh, multiple certifications or double certification um, for like different classes of science you know uh, you don't have earth science because we do not have anyone that yeah so science I can talk a little okay. bit if you want to mm -hmm. um, Science is a perfect example because science is so specific. You're certified yeah. in chemistry, you're certified in biology. So they've got, they did a really good job when they were putting that together to um, force some s competition, I guess you'd say, um, or insurance that you've got a job if you're certified in those areas. But we do have a uh, science teacher working on her second certification in physical science. Um, and when we have hired those positions, we've been very uh, conscious of the certifications. Um, right now with our, our numbers of teachers, it would not help me having an English and Social Studies certified teacher because I've already got them 
straight out with English and straight out with math and really straight out with social studies at three teachers, 3.5 teachers. Um, but in that science area, we, we are working on that specifically. And I think also uh, we just have to realize we're a small school mm -hmm. and if we want to be able to offer the courses to our students, we have to think creatively and that's, that's one of the ways to think creatively um, is to have that dual certification, I guess that's the yeah, term. Yeah, and several of our teachers do have that, special ed certified and a content area. Mm -hmm. So, good. Yeah. But it is certainly... Something we're very conscious of. Yeah. Good. I'll probably take it enough time. No, it was very good. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Gail's back there saying. Yeah. Didn't say anything. <laughs> 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 I know what you're saying. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess you're on. I guess. I know. Don't be a I guess I am. <laughs> So Al, needless to say, you're following two very difficult acts. Well, not really. Well, <laughs> what is that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I thought it's for his Steve. Okay, I. Uh, oh, but he's not I a rookie, he's already here. Is this yours? Did you pass that along? Or is this that someone else's? There we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So good evening. Um, talk about career technical education, and career technical education is a little different than uh, it has been years ago. Uh, certainly, uh, we want students to be uh, highly skilled. We have uh, partnered with uh, colleges and area businesses, and the expectation now is um, for all, for most anyways, for students to. Uh, go on to post-secondary uh, school of some kind. Um, so um, our budget goals for this year, we have a number of uh, career and technical goals, but the budget goals were to certainly maintain our existing programs. We want to maintain our programs. Uh, we do have a, a slight increase in, in staffing we like to see happen in teacher education. Uh, presently it's uh, funded by the district half time supplemented another 25% through a Perkins grant and we'd like to see that full time uh, due to an increase in enrollment. And then we uh, have a, a real partnership with the uh, high school and middle school. I feel that uh, our teachers continue to provide in numerous uh, middle and high school electives that I think are, are critical. Um, around us, you've, you've heard probably about the enrollment decreasing uh, over the years. Um, CTC enrollment has remained steady or increased slightly over the years. And I just gave that um, number two to explain uh, just briefly. We've seen some uh, increases and in, in decreases, but our out of district numbers have, made, have remained fairly stable uh, over the years. And when I say out of district enrollment, I'm referring just to two grades, 11th and 12th graders, who uh, participate in our programs. And I do want to mention now, in case I forget, um, our out of district um, students do pay tuition uh, to attend um, every year. So it's, it's a, right now it's coming in, Tom, you could clarify, it's roughly about half a million dollars in, in revenue. Uh, from our students coming in participating in the programs. Their school board pays us the tuition. Their school pays, but they're also, they get reimbursement, uh, tuition and transportation from the, from the state. It's never as much as a uh, mm -hmm. state it should be or is going to be. But did you do. say half a million, did you say? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you have to in the general fund. And then in, in Wilton, of course, uh, we continue to see strong enrollment in our CTC program. Um, Alan, excuse me. I, I'm pretty impressed with this uh, 
for enrollment, should I be? Um, is it low or high? I mean, I to think well, that 200 kids, I, students I, I, come to our and I, location. And it's, it's quite impressive in the morning when you see the, the three buses roll up and uh, yeah. students come in. It's about um, it's about half and half, half our students. Yeah, that's right. But still, we oh, have yeah. 200 kids. I think, I think it's uh, and, and I, I could get uh, a percentage, um, but I know Lisbon, for example, 11th, 12th graders, we have a very, very high percentage of students. That's okay. Uh, it's just true enrollment. I mean, to think that this, I mean, it, should I be proud of that? Um, that I'm sounds it. okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. I mean, I don't have any basis in which it, it, uh, would 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 should we have 300 in this area? Should we just have 150? I mean, are, are we exceeding what we think our expectations well, we, would have been? We try to always increase it. Um, you know, it's <coughs> the challenge is working with schools and developing a relationship with other schools. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and other schools are small, so they have. Uh, singletons in terms of their schedule so sometimes uh, courses are offered in their school only first block so that, that's competitive yeah. with us we try and we try and be flexible um, with schools you know transportation is always an issue uh, so you know, working with schools to try and uh, have students and that's only first block our students most of our out of district students 99 percent of them come first block that's when we arrange the transportation to make it reasonable so, uh, you start to talk about Lisbon. They're they're a large participator. Is very, that very, just, high, very okay. high. And how many different schools? Is, I mean, Lisbon. So the schools that participate um, is South is Linwood. So we have some Linwood students, and then uh, SAU 35, which is profile in Lisbon, and then we go north to uh, Grofton and the White Mountain region. Mm -hmm. So that comprises our region. Are all of these schools on the same block schedule? Um, oh, most of them. White Mountain. But uh, CTC courses are offered or, uh, every day. So it's, uh, most high schools uh, have day every other day. Okay. Uh, but CTC students come every day. And then we, our, our sister CTC, or our brother CTC, uh, school <laughs> is, is, sister. Is, is, a, is a regional. <laughs> we call it region three. So we, we do not duplicate programs, and we had some students go up there. This year we have 12 students um, attending school at the regional. Mm -hmm. We have about 50 of the regional students attending our programs. So we're doing pretty well on that. Yeah. Training pretty well. <laughs> Um, so um, presently we offer uh, eight programs and, and I, I just want to mention that when you see these numbers, some of our teachers are only teaching one block of class of CTE, 11th to 12th graders, and then they're teaching other electives. Um, so when you look at these, some of these numbers, they're well, extremely low. That, that is not their whole day. Um, most larger CTC centers your CT, CTE teachers are teaching 11th to 12th, 12th graders all day long. Our teachers are teaching 11th and 12th and then some um, high school electives and then some middle school electives even. So we do offer automotive, uh, digital video production, business programs, accounting, computer systems, uh, construction technologies which have included much more electrical and plumbing because that's, that's Definitely a need. Um, fire science, which is only one block, and that's um, a contractor service. We have someone come in from the fire academy to teach that. Health science, uh, teacher education. Yeah. We're presently not offering manufacturing, but we hope to. And I'll speak to that soon. Um, we do have a, a person who uh, runs our internships, our ELO program, which is. is I think very, very successful. Jen mentioned it earlier. What's um, e ELO? Uh, it, it's uh, extended. <laughs> elective, extended. Extended. Elective extended. Elective 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 extended. Elective. extended. <laughs> what, what, is, <laughs> what is it? Extended. Extended learning opportunity. Okay. <laughs> so, so if a student is interested in, in possibly uh, a course we don't offer, we try and develop that course for them, or it may be a uh, an internship or a work-based learning opportunity. Okay. And to Diane's point about the multiple certifications, that plays in that too in terms of being able to use those teachers throughout the school day? We do, and well, just 
specifically our health science teacher who was certified in health science, um, has, has been teaching health, the ninth and 10th grade offering. Uh, and she had to go through like three years of, of, of college classes to be certified as a health teacher. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but, but she, was able, she was willing to do that and we, we supported her in that and, and now she's teaching health for us. That's not what <coughs> And <clears throat> you see two paraprofessionals, and mostly paraprofessionals are under the special ed <coughs> services, but we do uh, fund two uh, because they run our preschool. So part of our teacher ed, we, we run, run our preschool. So they learn. Is that what you're saying? Well, we, you, you tell me, we say that again, please, Al. So we have two paraprofessionals. Right. Who, uh, who who run our preschool? Okay. So we have a preschool as part of our teacher ed program. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, okay. So, gotcha. they're, so they're <coughs> under the CTE budget. Okay. Gotcha. So um, you can see some uh, increases and decreases in enrollment over the years, and that's that's fairly typical. But we we fortunately we remain fairly stable. Um, programs. I mentioned other programs that are uh, or courses that are teachers are teaching. Uh, we do some introduction to automotive, some welding, uh, computer literacy, which is a um, state-mandated program. We do, we do more and more computer programming, uh, intro to building trades, woodworking, very popular with our middle school students. Uh, new course this year is outdoor survival skills and first aid. Child development. Excuse me, Alan. Is health LNA LNAs things like that? Well, the the health health science is, is part of uh, CTC. We do offer LNA, but part of it uh, is it's a state requirement is health. Yeah. It's mostly for ninth and tenth graders. That's an elective program. Yeah. Uh, graphics, web design, um, and this is what I want to wanted to mention about manufacturing is that um, we have had project lead the way for many many years. <clears throat> to teach Project Leader Way, you have to be certified as a Project Leader Way teacher. Um, our teacher, one of our teachers moved on um, to another job years ago. Another teacher retired. So our digital, vi digital video production teacher um, <coughs> has gone off and, and, and taken classes in Project Lead the Way for middle school. That's where you have to start. So he's presently teaching middle school uh, robotics, design and modeling. <clears throat> and we'll continue this summer, and hopefully we'll be offering Project Lead the Way again in the high school setting. And that's our goal. And as far as Project Lead the Way, Crystal didn't mention it, but teachers have been trained uh, at Lakeway uh, in March. So it's really a, a, a first grade through 12th grade initiative uh, to try and uh, increase students and working around the this, this STEM curriculum. <clears throat> and then, of course, we have uh, some electives, uh, beginning electives into the business world. And, and this is Carvino mentioned before, many of our courses, students can learn uh, Running Start, which is college credit. Um, fortune, and, and that was usually uh, for a fee of about $150. Um, anything under the STEM umbrella now it is funded by, by the DOE. And so a lot of our students are taking advantage of three to six credits, college credits, for no cost. So it's, it's a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. And last, last question before we go oh, another, of to the next page. Of these courses, would any be, would the graduates be given a certificate to help them get a job? Okay, well, in, uh, and that's when I mentioned earlier about one of our, one of our goals for career tech is to increase those certificate opportunities. Um, but one people are very familiar with is the LMA. So um, we have, over the years, we probably have close to 200 LMAs that we've uh, been able to certify coming out of our health science. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's such a need right now that uh, our LMAs, I'm told, they just started their clinicals the other day, are being hired um, on the floor for uh, to, to do certain responsibilities, obviously, legally, uh, until they get their LMAs and 
you know, most of the places that they do the clinicals hire them on the spot. So a lot of our students are, are, are hired right. uh, and get that certification. Um, most of our students do go on to post-secondary. Uh, just talking about health science, the past three years, 100% have gone on to post-secondary. 100%. So it's a great opportunity as the LNA as they pursue uh, whatever health career they're interested in. Uh, they have great paying jobs uh, really all over the country because we do uh, the maximum amount of uh, clinical hours, about 90 hours. Yeah, automotive has a lot of yeah, young men and women that go off to... Yeah, they do. Yeah. They do. Mm -hmm. We have, we have uh, again, very developed very good partnerships with uh, local community colleges, uh, for one, uh, and then some other colleges as well. So it's great opportunities. Um, you know, you mentioned automotive. Um, if, if a student is uh, motivated and, and a good student, uh, they can earn <coughs> certainly an associate's degree um, with, with very little cost because part of their associate's degree is a paid internship mm -hmm. at a dealership. So, so they do very well. Is there a reason though? I was surprised to look at those numbers, Dan, from, with Dan as having declined out. Is that? Not, not sure. We, uh, you know, a couple years ago it was at, a, at, at a, an all time high. We yeah. actually had a higher, um, a, a very um, excellent supplement worker. To, to <laughs> that people know around this around. table. <laughs> uh, because of the high numbers, but I think we're hoping that comes back up again. Yeah, I mean, it, it's probably just a, a blip, hoping. if you would. We're hoping. Yeah. Do you, I know that um, certain programs are developed and, and, and certainly some programs are a sign of the times and then they phase out. Um, but when you are looking at these programs here um, and you see the students go on or not go on, does, do you ever really assess these programs to the point where you, you say, yes, it's, it's something well, that we need to maybe look at? Well, part of what we, we, need, we do, and, and this is really done a, a lot of times through our advisory committee. So each program has to have an advisory committee that's comprised of people from the industry. Uh, Post-secondary has to be at the table. And, and we talk about really, um, you know, what, what is the job market? What's the job market for that industry in the state, uh, mm -hmm. in the North Country? And if there isn't a job market, um, then it's time to take a look at that program. And so we, we're constantly doing that. Uh, so you look at, um, I mentioned construction technologies. Part of what we're hearing, part of what we're seeing is a need, uh, especially in, in North Country for, for electricians and plumbers. Mm -hmm. So we've added more curriculum uh, pertaining. Yeah, which that used to be mostly, mostly building. building. Yeah. So, so right now we're, we're focusing on um, electricity quite a bit, you know, we, we did a mock of a, of a building and, and students are wiring it and, and, and going through that process. But as well as uh, we've, we've kind of been focusing on tiny homes, so we're building tiny homes, for example. So you're getting, getting all aspects of, of that, that construction. You're going to be on home garden television soon? <laughs> 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 Yeah. And, 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 and we have to be in tune with the skill set. So our students coming out of here, there has to be a seamless transition in the post-secondary or, or uh, trade school. So our students have to be very well prepared. And, and, a, lot, and a lot of times, because we've, we've been, I think, really fortunate with, with the timing. I guess my, my involvement with the timing, you know, stepping into a brand new facility uh, in 2011, uh, everything was, was brand new and up to date. Um, so we have some some uh, technology in, in our labs that community colleges don't even have. Um, in fact, some 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 industry some industry partners do some training here from time to time. Um, I know the hospital has has often done 
some, some PD here in our, in our lab because we have the technology to help support that. So our, our students are, are, are pretty fortunate. So do all of these programs, all of them, have um, tuitioned in students? Yes. Well, we hope to uh, develop that, that program next year. Yeah. Project we do away. Professor Humphrey is still doing it. Professor Humphrey is still doing Jimmy, they're going to be looking for somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Assist. Okay. Well, sure. <laughs> so the, <clears throat> the next page is just, uh, again, some, uh, I guess it answers the question there. Oh, well, there it is. Um, other district enrollments in certain areas. So, you know, our, the challenge for our teachers because most of all CT programs are, are two years, um, so you have to meet a, a set of competencies over a two year span to be a completer. Um, most larger CTC centers have two instructors at least per program. Well, we don't have that luxury. You know, so we have combined in auto, we have auto one and auto two students. So it's a real challenge, I think, and our, and our teachers do a nice job trying to, to separate the two at the same time and develop um, a, you know, a curriculum and instruction that, that is very dear to the student to try and meet those competencies. Um, the only area in which that is not uh, true is, is health science, which, which there are two teachers. And I mentioned before, we have 12 students going up to the gym. For what else? Variety courses, they, um, they offer welding, which seems to be, seems to be popular. Absolutely. Um, that may be taking some of our other students away. They, they didn't have welding. Mm -hmm. um, our students would probably be in our office. Some of our students do auto and welding. Um, Jay Rotsey has been popular over the years. Uh, now it's not so much. I'm not sure why. Same instructor, same program, just, you know, just slow right now. And uh, the culinary program is really strong. Are they still doing a which program up there? No. 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 So they're, they're looking at at much of your comment, and they're looking at a, a building construction. Mm -hmm. So they're evaluating all the programs to see. They're, 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 a lot of the programs are based on the agricultural mm -hmm. economy, so they're evaluating that. So going through some changes. Times change. And so when you say what other agricultural programs would they have? They still they still offer some electives up there, um, but as far as uh, CTC programs, their enrollment decreased. They didn't see they didn't have a strong enrollment. So how many programs do they offer in CTC? I think right now they're offering six. Six. So they've scaled back. And they had uh, several years of, of voters telling them they needed to do that. Yeah. And just to give you an idea, when you look at numbers our, our teachers are teaching, um, just quickly, a quick spreadsheet on, on, the, on kind of the caseload they may have filled the day, they list the courses. Uh, but over the course of the day, our, our CCC teachers are we're seeing about 530 students throughout the day, so well, really throughout the two days, the alternate, alternate days. So going back to um, the uh, enrollments, and you have for the fire science, and you have it, it's under contract, we contract it yep. out. So is there a minimum that, I mean, I know that with um, career and technical programs, it takes two years to phase something out, so you can't just phase something out. You can't just stop, you know, not offering it. But we have two in, mm -hmm. so is the contract adjusted for that, or is it is it a flat fee? Well, it, 
fiscally to make uh, to run that program. Uh, we need two out of district students. We have two, <coughs> we have two out of district students. All right. uh, so it's not costing Littleton anything, um, but for other reasons, um, we're, we're taking a hard look at that. Okay. And we, we try to enhance our recruiting strategies. We reached out to area um, you know, volunteer departments. The, the person who teaches it is, is very well uh, networked. Um, you know, he's, he's a local person, but he works for the Fire Academy in Concord for a long period of time. He knows all the chiefs. Um, I think you'll you hear on, on the news periodically about um, the, the difficult time smaller departments are, are having to attract volunteers. Uh, so I think we're seeing part of that. <coughs> but the students who have participated in fire science, uh, many of them have gone on to a post-secondary, <coughs> going to grade school for that, uh, and many of them are now um, working throughout the state as a, as a firefighter. Right, they, we had nine enrolled at, at one right. time, and I'm sure a lot of them went on right. to work, but now we, the last two years, we've only had two. <coughs> and they typically earn certification. Correct. Yeah. They have to pass. I'm one. just saying there's they a balance pass, here. Yeah. They have to pass the fire science one, which is very challenging. But doable. Yeah. But that's a job certification. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, if, again, part of the uh, one of our CT goals is, is to have those endorsements or, or industry recognized certifications in all areas. That does some of the cost uh, because often there, there's a, a cost to those assessments. Um, right. But. but I think it's, it's very worthwhile to have uh, those certifications moving out into the working world. And the last page is just a uh, summary of, of the budget in all areas. So when you look at your, your larger sheet, uh, then you'll get probably from Mr. Mangles at some point, or uh, current technicals of 1300s. And then you have a number of object codes um, listed. Um, so these areas would include all the object codes. So in auto, for example, uh, that 13,000 you see way over on the right, that would include uh, you know, the 610 uh, supplies, for example, any contracted services, uh, you know, lift maintenance, anything would be under that. So, Anything to operate that program would be under that category. So you have some history here if you want to uh, review it. I did pull something out this year which is a little different. Uh, we, we do have to budget tuition for our students to go up to the regional. And every year, I don't know how many people will be signing up for September to go. Uh, but we do get revenue back. And it comes probably a year, year after. Tom, but we yeah. just the budget for that. So um, <coughs> you see that at the top that we try and estimate how many students will be going up to the regional. Um, and we've been pretty close in the past. Um, so if, if you go to the two columns on the right, just want to explain the process because each program is different. Some programs use a lot of supplies, some do not, etc. <coughs> So I sit down with all teachers and we do really um, request list what they think they need to run the program. Uh, so that's the higher number uh, you'd see um, without tuition, 119,000, for example. And they say, well, how could we reduce that? Because my discussions with the board uh, and with the superintendent uh, was kind of direct them, you know, you, you got to look at it. At minimally level funding. I'm looking for a, an increase uh, in a position. What are you going to show me? You know, what are you going to have to have a give and take here? So, um, and <coughs> something that we haven't been probably doing enough of is uh, looking at our capital reserve for career and tech, which is pretty healthy. So, our new equipment, sometimes very expensive replacement equipment working with the board to hopefully uh, 
take that out of capital reserve. So that's a huge savings right there, about forty thousand. And then, uh, similar to the uh, process, Jim was talking about looking at three-year trends and making some cuts. <coughs> And also, we always get a little money out of Perkins, Perkins brand, um, which um, I usually shift a lot of our field trips. So if you look deep in the budget, you probably don't see a lot of money for field, tri field trips. Like we just went to the uh, auto show in Manchester, took all the auto students down there. Uh, we're going to uh, Berlin Community College this next Friday, uh, bus transportation primarily, either colleges or industry recognized uh, visits. And that will probably come out of Perkins, so, so those students are still attending uh, those. So, um, you know, coming in, we know without that, that tuition piece, um, really quite low uh, compared to what we have been. With, and again, with our enrollment remaining steady, so hopefully, uh, we, we foresee being able to do what we need to do. Okay. Question now. Your 530 figure on uh, enrollment, is that yes. what that was? Is that per week, per day? Are you telling me that 530 kids come through the CTC? Every two days. Every two days? Yes. 530 kids? About 250 a day. With, with, uh, with the 11th graders, Ninth and tenth graders for electives and middle schoolers. And, and 15 middle schoolers in Woburn can feel like 30. Do that, Bill. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That Bill. I remember that. Yeah. I remember that class. <laughs> so, so part, of, part of what we have for, for Littleton students, because um, most CTCs are, are, are centered in a high school. They don't have much contact with middle schoolers. Mm -hmm. That could be good, that could be bad. Uh, but for us, in terms of program promotion, uh, they're just above us. You know, they're on the fourth floor, so they're very accessible. And they, and they participate in a lot of the programs. So you have a student that is, is in the seventh grader, has an interest in being an electrician. He's, He's, he or she's exposed to that curriculum at a, at a young age, which is, I think, important. <laughs> and we do run um, some camps for middle schoolers in the summer, which have been very popular. And those are uh, from, from our sending schools as well. So hopefully expose them to what we have to offer. Very good. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got um, six o'clock, right? Is that the? Yeah, yeah. that's that's good. We're never used to cut quitting. No, that's good. Do you want a six o'clock? Is that it for you, Anne? I don't know what time it is. Yeah, it's five o'clock. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and obviously I I just soon not rush. I mean, this right. has all been right. very good, and I yeah. apologies to obviously everybody who's been sitting there waiting, but you know I. I would. You would prefer to stop at six o'clock. I I would, and given their yeah. due time at the next meeting, yeah. we'll they start need, off. They and need to get home too. Start right. on day. Yeah. 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 Just start off the week prior. Next yeah, week. that's right. And yeah. yes, no. before we before we adjourn, I would like to make two statements. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, one is a public service announcement. I have personally witnessed Jen and her staff in two drills when it comes to the safety <coughs> of our children. Mm -hmm. It's excellent. Let me tell you, everyone who, who have children in the school, you don't have to worry. And if they take that same dedication, that same competence into running our school, again, we don't have anything to worry about. Now, what I want us all to be thinking about is a significant, a significant part of our budget is payroll and associated costs. Is it $8 million or 12? 16. I mean, the budget's 12, but the payroll... 15 plus. Okay, so we're talking about $11 million worth of payroll cost. Mm -hmm. What I want us to be thinking about is this. I don't think there's ever been an assessment or analysis on non-teaching positions and how they do their work. 
when I had companies of two or three hundred people and departments would be doing a billion four hundred million dollars in business every year, we would look at each position and see uh, it's a forty hour position, but they may need they may need help. Or it's a forty hour position and they have some excess capacity. Or there's a twenty hour position and they do it a lot more than 20 hours, or it's a 20 hour position, and they're really not doing too much. So I think it's incumbent upon us to look at where we spend a portion of this eight or $10 million, whatever it is, in salaries and benefits. Otherwise, I don't think we're doing our due diligence to the taxpayers. We know we have these folks working, but can we work smarter and better? I don't know. Do we need you know, that's, that's what I want to put out, because I don't think it's never, ever been done, and we're talking about millions of dollars without actually looking at the process. Yeah. And that's what I want us to be thinking about. Okay. Well, I, one thing I would say for sure, I mean, and I'm going to echo some of Ryan Ward's uh, words from, uh, from last spring or whatever, uh, the, the leadership, the, the local leadership, the homegrown leadership, if you would, that we now have, in the uh, in the elementary school and the high school is kind of put some fresh wind in, in our sails. Steve coming here from his background and as not a interim or whatever but a real full-fledged superintendent has certainly brought a lot of energy and insight to the program and the board has responded well to that. Um, so I mean, I, certainly I'm as, as enthused as I've ever been about the, the quality of what we're doing and the efficiency with which we're using our allocated resources. And uh, obviously I was playing with Mr. Smith in terms of him having to follow <laughs> the two girls, and that is kind of a two tough acts to follow, but, but you know, obviously Al gives us great insight into, uh, in the career technical program and, and, you know, the future that that has in our community. So, I mean, Littleton's got a lot, we, you know, we got, as I've always said, we, we've never done it on the cheap by any stretch of the imagination. And not to say you know, Mel, that we don't have to obviously reevaluate, just make sure every year that we're doing the best job we and can to, with what we have. Right, I agree. And to yeah. say we do it the most economical way is not cheap. It's the biggest bang for the buck. I, I, I think we're in a good position for like the first time in a long time. We have administrators that have been with us a couple of years, not only homegrown, but they've been in the position for a couple of years. We have a superintendent that has been here with us for a couple of years. And so the novelty has worn off and they can actually see and assess um, far greater than what we've had in the past. I think your question or your statement is really good. You know, everyone has to look because if you're not utilizing your money properly, you can't keep asking for more money. So you have to basically say, well, I can take it from here and put it over there. And, you know, because you have eyes. And these people have been in our school system for quite a long time now. So they kind of know where the whole, what is it called? What was the hole that? The mole hole. <laughs> the mole hole. Oh, no. <laughs> you should know where that is. Yeah. <laughs> I know. But um, I guess um, before we leave, I, I, I know we've had the traditional, uh, you know, uh, uh, presentations uh, from different department heads and things. But I kind of also would like to have one from uh, the co curricular. Uh, athletic I don't know if that's one person or not yeah. um, and then also, also one from guidance we have we've never had one from guidance okay. before mm -hmm. so sure. that might be good to just bring us up to speed on what yeah. some of the realities yeah. are that we don't know um, that they face every day so yeah. just throwing that yeah. out there. As, as important as the numbers are and certainly we're concerned with them but at least once you get a chance to review uh, the budget package, I mean, uh, they've done a very good job this year with their initial offering, if mm -hmm. you would, that, you know, it, it's very conservative and been well thought through. Not to say that we don't want to look at those numbers, but obviously listening to what we listened to tonight and what we hope to hear from you from Dale and, and Kelly and, and Greg and others like Diane said that, you know, it, the better we understand how the system is working and have identified the goals that we need to address, I mean, that all helps us in, in understanding the whole thing, and it, it isn't 
just a, a bunch of bodies out there. And, and, and truthfully, uh, you know, we've gotten presentations tonight, I mean, that are significantly, you use the term better, but it's really been much more multi-dimensional than uh, what we've gotten in the past. That was a good format. Yeah. We yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. So. I would say impressive. Yeah, yeah impressive. But it's, it's not impressive for impressive sake, but but impressive for effectiveness. I mean that it's you know it's it's nice to understand the challenges and how we're looking at things. And there's one other thing too, and I know someone over there is probably going to address it. Is um, and I'm not talking about Lakeway per se, but I'm talking about you know our buildings and what we you know some of the things. Those are like. Yeah, they also yeah. you're gonna be you're gonna be doing it yeah. but also with the safety um, you know like what we need to do what are some of the things that we can do to help keep our students safe that are physical structures in the school and and how we're going to address them or or are and we some already, we've already yeah. addressed. Mm -hmm. Or some that you've already addressed. I was going to say, are we already cool on that? I have no idea, well, yeah, but if I'm, you could just address that yeah. for us, please. Yeah, obviously, as you saw just in the news today, I mean, the horrific stuff that can happen, and mm -hmm. some of that stuff you just can never, you, you can't be physically prepared for it, unless you're going to have armed guards at every building, but culturally, procedurally, you know, all that stuff that you can put in place on a daily basis, awareness or whatever see say something do something whatever all that type of stuff I mean that that raises your readiness significantly and that's so. what I observed those two times for two hours each yeah mm -hmm. very impressive yeah. good job guys yeah okay. thank you <laughs> enough said enough said thank you everyone great we'll okay. thank you very right. much and but now next week the meeting will be in the gap in the gap okay, okay. thank you <laughs>